Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Rivera, CEO of the ACG West region and ACG Los Angeles. Welcome to what should be a very insightful look into the current state of the entertainment and media space. For so long, this would have been a discussion about content for the sake of content. And though high quality, engaging content remains critical, increasingly companies and investors view content as a wedge into more diverse monetization strategies, direct to consumer, retail, intellectual property, live events, and so on. I'd like to welcome our moderator, Andrew Apfelberg, a partner at Greenberg Glusker and a member of the ACG Los Angeles board. Andrew, we've got a great discussion today, so I'd like to turn things over to you. You're on mute. I'm always much more eloquent when I'm on mute, trust me. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you for um, attending. Those of you watching, thank you for participating. Those of you who are speaking, um, Michael, thank you and the ACG staff for setting this up and for setting the stage because, you know, we believe for a while that there is a significant intersection between private equity investment and what people would traditionally think of as content. And as you pointed out, that concept of content is changing dramatically and the purposes for it is changing dramatically. So we want to explore this primarily from two different perspectives. We've got Mark and Lauren who you know, are seasoned private equity professionals and we've got Paul and Steve who are executives. And I think that by providing both point of views, it will help our ACG members to understand the opportunities for them within this space. Because there is a surprising number of deals that ACG members are already working on and can be working on uh, in the future in this space. So I'm gonna give you a very brief background on each person and encourage you to look up their bios, um, which have been provided to you. Um, first, I want to introduce Steve, who uh, is a vice president at Churning Group, but is also, more importantly for our purposes today, the chief operating officer at Exploding Kittens. And so while he has, you know, come up as a private equity professional, you know, his current assignment is as an executive. And, um, you know, so it's, it's great for him to be able to provide us with both those points of view. Um, Lauren is actually the general counsel and chief compliance officer of the Churning Group, where, you know, she oversees, you know, a lot of their deals. In fact, I had the opportunity to work with her uh, on an acquisition um, as well. Um, Paul is a content creator and, you know, previously has been at Paramount. He's been at Rat Pack and recently has... Um, formed his own company called Project X, where he has, um, you know, created lots of different content that's already hit the screens and will soon to be hitting the screens, including a reboot of the popular Scream franchise. Last but certainly not least is Mark, who is a finance professional. He worked for many years at a firm you guys will be quite familiar with, Brentwood, obviously, uh, Brentwood Associates, a PE firm, uh, branded consumer focused PE firm in LA that I'm sure many of you have worked with. Um, he co-founded Causeway, which is a PE firm focused on sports, fitness, and related industries in 2013. He's also co-owner of the Boston Celtics, the San Francisco 49ers, and closest to my heart, the English Premier League's Leeds United. And so without further ado, I'm going to try to dive in and lead the discussion with the uh, idea of trying to help all ACGers understand the opportunities where they can play within this. If you guys have questions, please pose them in the question and answer function, and I will try to get to them during the program. If not, I'll get to them at the end. With that, you know, in, in looking at Numerous recent industry studies, PE investors and buyers have been really significantly expanding their activity in the media and entertainment sector, which is great for them. But what about for the companies? I mean, Paul, why would you as a content creator want a PE investor, you know, as your partner, um, just generally, but especially when, you know, historically or, you know, opportunistically, you could also pick a, a debt provider, for example. 
Why, why would you want to go PE? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting shift right now uh, in the business. As it, look, many of you know, um, private equity generally didn't jump into the content space. And I think part of that was the unpredictability of the sort of the modeling and the cash flows. But there's been a big shift now in distribution platforms, which, you know, interestingly from the content creating space has taken away some of the risk of how these film and TV shows are, you know, sort of hit the screen and hit different uh, distribution platforms and allows for a little more predictability in, in sort of cash flow modeling and makes it less venture and, and much more uh, in line with what private equity would normally look for. You know, for us, it's we would always be on the side of wanting to be with an equity partner, whether it be venture or private equity rather than debt, just because from a valuation standpoint, it helps out a little bit. Um, but what we've seen now, especially in this space, and especially if you're looking at, you know, acquiring libraries and sort of consistent cash flows is you know, the availability of capital from a private equity provider is, is a much bigger number than we'd get generally from venture or debt. Um, and you couple that with a lot of the private equity that's going into the business, you've got really knowledge, knowledgeable management teams out there with really good strategic partners that help businesses like us. Um, so as we've shifted our focus from what was traditionally really at-risk capital in content creation to now more sustainable business models. It's become a really, you know, it's opened up for us a lot of different conversations than just going to the normal debt providers. Um, so it's, and it's been interesting because I think, as you said, the shift has been private equity jumping in on these big acquisitions, you know, much more than they used to in the past. And based on what you've seen, has that been a successful marriage? You know, it's early to say because a lot of it's happened in the last two years. Um, you know, the one sort of thing that you have to look at is with private equity, as as we've always seen, is how quickly they want to enter and exit businesses rather than being long standing in these businesses. And I think that's where we're going to know if it's been successful or not. Libraries have been trading at valuations that are unrealistic, but because of the scarcity of those assets, you know, the returns have been very, very, very profitable for almost everybody. It'll be interesting to see if, you know, three, four years from now, that still stays in place. I just think it's a little early to know yet if that's been successful on the private equity side. For companies like us, it's been very successful. Um, but you want it to be successful on both sides. So to that end, you know, Steve, there have been a lot of studies that, you know, some of these same studies that highlight the fact that these DE funds are also targeting manufacturers and distributors of physical and digital products, you know, such as games you might know a thing or two about games. So, you know, why do you think you guys as a company would want a PE partner? Um, and, and, and if you do, would you want one that's a specialist in this field or would you prefer, you know, a specialist in media entertainment or would you prefer a specialist in branded consumer or would you prefer a generalist? Um, I would actually say the, the latter too, both, you know, branded media and consumer, I think, you know, Exploding Kittens is kind of an interesting case. Uh, the company, is, you know, at its core is an incredibly creative company. For those of you who are unfamiliar, it's a, a board games company that has uh, you know, had a tremendous amount of success on Kickstarter and now expanded to be one of the largest independent tabletop games companies in the country. But at the, you know, going back a couple of years when they were first starting to, starting to talk to the churning group, uh, they were kind of at an inflection point. Matt, Matt uh, Inman and Alon Lee are the two founders are at their core, very creative individuals. And, and they created this lightning in a bottle and a really, really impressive brand with a really passionate audience. And what they saw was there's an opportunity with something like that, that has this real authenticity and passion from its consumers to start going into other verticals. So to expand beyond just tabletop games into digital into video games into licensed products into film and television etc and when we start talking about a lot of things like that those were things that they just didn't have a lot of experience with and the right partner would be really compelling to them in truth they at the time weren't they weren't looking at tons of pe investors and vc investors the company was growing quickly it was profitable and it was much more about the strategic relationship they could develop in with TCG in particular, it's a firm that both has a ton of media and entertainment experience, but also a lot of experience around uh, commerce, consumer products, these other verticals that are kind of adjacent to film and television and entertainment. 
And that combination in together was really attractive to Matt and Alon around finding the right partner to kind of really take the business to the next level. Well, and, and to that end, I mean, you in your current role, you transitioned from being at TCG to being at the company side. I mean, I would imagine that that is an advantage for a PE fund trying to get a company to do a deal is being able to, for lack of a better word, loan out someone like you. So, I mean, how has that been for you? I mean, do they resent you in the board meetings as this outsider? Are they excited to have you there because of your perspective? How's the marriage gone from your point of view? Um, I'd be curious to hear what Matt and Alon say, but um, I think it's been really successful. The, the whole concept has been really successful, I think, for all parties. So the way it came about was two years ago, we, you know, we, when I was on the TCG side of the house, were talking to Matt and Alon about bringing in additional people at the management level to help do kind of all of the things I just, just discussed. And, you know, one conversation led to another and it ended up being a, just for a variety of reasons, a, a really good opportunity for me to make the jump from the investment side to the operating side. I think what, what helped get that going was uh, I developed a very strong relationship with Matt and Alon and the rest of the management team in the preceding year and a half as an investor with them. And so making that transition was actually fairly seamless. I already knew the business really well. I worked well with all of them. And we kind of all knew what we were getting. And it, and it was, you know, it was an opportunity for us at TCG to be able to provide more value to one of our companies. I think it was an opportunity for the company also on the flip side to get a lot of value out of the investor. And it's worked really well so far, at least from my perspective. At first, they thought I was a spy for the first week or two, but we got over that fast. You sure you're not? I'm okay. kidding. Well, with that, I'd actually want to turn it over to, you know, Lauren and Mark from the private equity perspective. You know, you know, we heard why companies, you know, whether pure content like Paul or, or, or you know, started with branded consumer and going into content like Steve, why they might be interested in private equity, but why would private equity be interested in them? What, what, why do you guys invest in this sector, uh, media, entertainment, sports, as opposed to a different sector? Sure, I, I can start if that's easiest. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for us on the PE side of things, we're looking for obviously businesses that can grow with the consumers. We're a consumer facing investment firm. Um, and our primary focus ends up being um, around passionate audiences. And usually that starts with a passionate founder who has created some sort of business around um, you know, what they really enjoy. And as a result, there is what we call an accidental company that um, has been created usually by just connecting with other people who are also passionate about that, that um, space, whether that's uh, tabletop gaming or, for example, our meat eater company, which is really focused on hunting and fishing in a sustainable way. Um, so when we, if we use meat eater, for example, we saw that the, it, there was a television show in six seasons on Netflix and people were really, really interested in it. And we saw that there can be a, an entire company around that. Um, and, and there can be a lot more different verticals that isn't just the content. You can start selling merchandise to them. You can do live events, you can do podcasting, um, you know, any number of things, different verticals beyond fishing and wildlife. And so for us, it's, it's understanding that there is an audience there that feels very strongly about a specific subject or activity or passion or hobby and realizing that they're also willing to put a lot of money behind that and um, using the content as a way to, to acquire those customers for, for these other verticals. Well, you know, it's interesting you brought up Meteor because that was a deal that I as an ACG member worked on. The accounting firm was an ACG member. <laughs> the consultant who was basically the investment banker was an ACG member. Um, and, and so it's interesting because a lot of ACG folks you know, may not feel that they're involved in this space, but 
you know, whether they're coming from, you know, a typical branded consumer side or, you know, in my case, I represented First Light, which was the apparel brand. I think this convergence is going to continue to enhance and increase. And if people don't realize they're in it now, they'll realize it soon. So thank you for bringing up that example. But, Definitely. you know, now, Mark, I'm going to grill you. So, you know, as a PE investor, I mean, obviously you started at Brentwood, you've done things other than that. Why did you decide to invest in sports and, and, and media? And, and what's the value proposition that, that you try to share with companies when you're explaining why they should go with you? Sure. So um, I guess I'd start by saying, you know, at our firm Causeway today, we were, my partners and I who formed that were part of the group that bought the Boston Celtics back in 02. Um, and we were, um, as you said, I was at Brentwood, then I was at a traditional tech oriented VC fund. And so were my partners. We bought the team uh, thinking we were buying something that sold, you know, popcorn and hot dogs and tickets. But uh, after having the team, we realized it's really a media company. Um, and, and then we learned through that sort of the power and the value of media, especially must have content like you have around sports and you have around particular teams. And, and that led us to look for more and more opportunities like that and eventually form this firm now Causeway which is focused on, as you said, media, sports, and health and fitness, but really all consumer-facing entities. And so we still love media companies where uh, you're not in the business of simply bidding against you know, Fox or Disney for content rights, uh, but where you can own something unique and something that has real value, something people are willing to pay for. Um, you know, examples, because we've review some of those here would be things like for us flow sports which broadcasts live track meets and lacrosse and volleyball and wrestling and things that people actually will pay a lot for because they're passionate about it but they can't get it anywhere else um, again because it's just not on NBC so um, we love those kind of opportunities. Again, I think Lauren touched on it where you have a passionate fan base that's willing to, you know, put money behind their interests. And that extends to e-commerce and physical products companies that we have where um, I haven't seen personally or been involved in those where it started as a media company and then they did just an amazing job of adding on e-commerce. Those have always been sort of incremental, but certainly there are product companies, e-commerce companies that have done amazing jobs on the content side and so develop a passionate following, uh, both for their products and for the content they put out. And so that's a real high value add to those e-commerce companies. Um, if nothing else, it reduces their dependence on all the other channels that you would have to pay for uh, to acquire customers today that are more and more difficult and more and more expensive. So the content becomes really, really important for, for companies like that. And, um, you know, Lauren's mentioned a few. We certainly have some of those things like, you know, a tracksmith where it's they've just got a cult like following for their running, um, both on their content and then on their clothing. So, sorry, long winded answer, but that's how I describe it. No, that's exactly what we wanted to hear. But I'm going to grill you and Lauren a little bit more. So, if you're pitching against a generalist PE firm, what do you tell an executive like Paul or Steve? Why should they go with you who, who are specialists in this area as opposed to a generalist firm? Lauren, please go ahead first if you'd like. Sure. I mean, to me, and Steve and Paul can kind of jump in here if they disagree. I would, I would specifically want a specialist in this firm because that we do this day in and day out, you know, we're, we're looking at these companies, we're working with the founders and um, looking at additional ways to continue with their expanding the, the reach of their passionate audience. So in, we all come from operational backgrounds. I think all three of our founders have, um, you know, significant operational history doing different areas. 
But at the end of the day, we are all in fact operators who are now in, investing and, um, you know, but are, but are primarily focused on the consumer facing um, passionate audience brand uh, companies. And so if, if I was in the company's shoes, that's who I would want to partner with, not someone who is spread in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I'd actually turn it around a little, Andrew, and say that I'd be worried about any management team that didn't prefer a specialist over a generalist. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's a good indication of the way they think about how you work with an investor. Um, you know, the call I had right before this one was the CEO of one of uh, the companies I'm on the board of, and the time is spent talking about, you know, what else we're seeing in the marketplace similar to his company so that he understands the benchmarks. He's looking for, you know, comps and benchmarks against some of the KPIs he's focused on right now, and we can give him that perspective because this is what we spend our time on. Um, and not a generalist. So um, yeah, I, I, it's sort of why wouldn't you, I think is the better question. 100% I agree. I, I agree with that from our perspective. I mean, I think from two standpoints, right? One, when what I don't like doing is having to educate a potential investor in the business that we're in. Um, just because I think that if I'm already having to get over that hurdle, it's starting from a wrong place because I don't think there's the kind of synergy that you want. And then we've always been firm believers of, you know, the smartest idea in the room wins, right? So we're not arrogant enough to think that we have a total, you know, foothold on any business that we're in. And if there's people that have diversified their portfolios across, you know, this industry, but in a bunch of different ways that can help us grow our business, we're, you know, that's what we are looking for in addition to just, you know, funding. It's not about just the money. It's about how we can grow collectively the business. But Lauren and, and, and Mark, you both mentioned passionate audiences, loyal customer bases. I want to drill down on that a little bit. Um, in, in, in our pre-meeting, you guys also mentioned authenticity in addition to loyal customer base and, and, and passion. Um, I'm going to turn it first to Steve, then to Paul, but how do you guys from the company side um, define that authenticity? How do you gauge that passion? Uh, how do you determine if that customer base is loyal and then turn that to your advantage and, and utilize that? So I go, I'll, I'll go first. Um, yeah, look, with EK in particular, Exploding Kittens in particular, um, you know, the, the company was started because Matt and Alon wanted to disconnect a little bit uh, and make something cool and fun that they themselves loved. Um, it wasn't such, it wasn't an endeavor where you're saying, hey, there's a white space here, let's go try and fill that hole. It was more, we wanna create something we really love. You know, Alan is a game designer at heart, that's his whole career. Matt is an award-winning uh, cartoonist and creative uh, and writer. And they wanted to create something they loved. And when they first released the first Exploding Kittens game, it broke every record there was in Kickstarter. It clearly, uh, like when you talk about how, how do you judge whether you're engaging with a, a, a fan base, you know, they're still the most backed project in Kickstarter history with 220,000 people who backed it, something like $8.8 .8 million in capital raise in, in a 30 day uh, Kickstarter. And so right out of the gate, you could tell there was a really passionate group of people uh, still to this day, if you go on the Kickstarter for EK, which is now six years old, there are still people talking in the, in the comment boards about the game. They still use that as a place to meet and, and chat. Um, the other thing we see is just the audience, or not audience, our consumer reaction on social media and our interaction with our own customer service teams and how uh, engaged all of the kids who play it are and dressing up in costumes and making their own Taco Cat you know, costumes and buying every game and, and putting them online and all of, all of that, they, you, can, you can just kind of, this isn't an analytical way to do it, but you can, you get a sense of just how passionate people are when they do buy Exploding Kittens. It's not just another game on their shelf. Um, so that's kind of how we think about it at EK. Paul, what about you? How do you think about passion and authenticity and loyal customer base? Yeah, and you know, it's interesting for us because when we look at what our audience is and what our sort of mission for our company, we're trying to reach, you know, what I would call sort of a four quadrant 
audience for content, right? So in that you're going to have very diverse interests for different groups and authenticity for those groups is going to be very different. And so we take it a little step back and say, how do we then find the best creators for a broad audience? And so when we look at our audience as to who we have to be authentic for, it's not so much the consumer because that is the end product and how that's going to get out. And we're, we're not a distribution platform. So we have to go ahead and then license the stuff to distribution platforms. So we look at authenticity a little bit from the creators that we work with and creating an environment for the best creative work that we can do uh, and then figure out the best sort of model for what that creative content is. One of my partners is, is a fairly big writer. And from the beginning, he said, look, we should really have one goal, which is to make the most commercial content we can that's smart and the smartest content we can that's commercial. Um, so when we look at sort of our audience base, it's less the end user from a consumer basis and really the partners that we bring in to bring us intellectual property ideas, producers, directors, and talent, and just create the best creative version of whatever that piece of IP is, and then worry a little bit more about getting it out once it's done. So taking, say, the Scream franchise as an example, how were you able to gauge the authenticity, the passion, the loyal fan base for that? Well, that, that, that was an interesting one. So that was something that we went after because we knew that there was a market for that type of horror film to come back. It's been 25 years from the first one. And we went back to the beginning. And, you know, Wes Craven, who was one of the original creators, um, we went to his widow to make sure that she would be on board with what we were doing. Um, and then the original writer we brought back in. It was He was somebody who he was going to do a deal with, you know, the Weinstein company as they came out of bankruptcy and, that he got so, you know, he ended up in a lawsuit with them on the fourth one, shockingly, that uh, anybody would end up in a lawsuit with those guys. And we came up with a storyline, went to him and got him to buy off on it. And once he was involved, the fan base went crazy. Um, and we really had let very little information out. But as we slowly start to leak things that are going to come out for this movie that's coming out in January, the fans are going nuts. And for us, it's about making sure that you're honoring those who did it the right way before and not trying to, you know, completely ignore sort of a, a real fan base that's rabid. So Mark, I'm gonna turn it to you and then, then turn it to Lauren. I mean, when you're analyzing an investment opportunity, how do you guys um, measure the authenticity? How do you measure the passion? How much of a factor is that as compared to um, other items that you guys are looking at when you're underwriting a deal? Um, well, it's certainly, you know, important. If it's not there, we're not going to do the deal. Um, you know, to other factors, there are a lot of other KPIs that are, are critical as well. But it's a little bit of a, you know it when you see it. So, you know, the, the companies I touched on for us, like, like a Tracksmith, you know, I reached out to a few folks who I knew uh, were competitive runners. And they either had the brand or they knew about it and they all use the same term. They go, oh, it's got a cult-like following, right? That's what you want to hear. You're just getting that sanity check, um, you know, from the marketplace, right? Um, and the same with our other companies as you walk through them. There, there is that feedback in the market where those folks, it's not everyone, but those folks who are in their target demo um, really exhibit an understanding and a passion for those products and services. Um, and then that supports your conviction that, you know, whether it's the LTV or otherwise, you know, is sustainable or has room to grow. Uh, because there, if there isn't that authenticity, if there isn't that passion for it, those, those are very hard metrics and really important metrics, but very hard metrics to maintain in the, the direction you want. And how much harder is it to determine with a company that's not a, a, a sports team? I mean, take the Celtics, for example. I mean, clearly for years, they've got a history of the city supporting them, but also people across the country supporting them and being passionate and going to each game and excited if they make the playoffs. Well, that's a lot harder with some of your other investments to determine. They don't necessarily have that history and there's not that live event factor. So how do you measure it for those types of investments? Yeah, I, I think the metrics actually still remain very similar. Um, you know, if it's, it's something like the team or if it's something like flow, you're looking at, um, you know, what the subscriber is willing to pay, what the churn rate is, what the LTV, um, you know, flow <laughs> broadcasts track meets and people pay $29.99 a month. 
and they stay around for years. Um, in fact, the company's recently given up the monthly subscription option and just gone straight to annuals because so many people subscribe for years. Um, that's when you know you really found something. It's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to rock, watch a track meet. But again, for those people who care about it, this is the place they can find it. Lauren, how do you guys look at it? And expanding it out a little bit, you know, based on Mark's point, in, you know, if it's a niche audience, how do you determine if that niche audience is, is large enough or willing to spend enough money to justify your underwriting decision? Yeah, I think that, you know, we look at a number of different factors. I think like Mark, we look, we use kind of the social factor of what people are saying on Reddit and what the social media engagement is. And if we go talk to people who are interested in, um, you know, these specific areas, what are the three products that they're using or buying or watching in a specific space? And if you keep hearing the same one over and over, and people feel very strongly about a specific one that gives you a good signal. I, I, the other things that we look at, which are a little bit more data driven, are you know consumer acquisition costs. We don't invest in companies that spend a lot of money to acquire a customer. We we are looking for companies that that acquisition is done organically, and oftentimes that's done through the content. Um, the other thing is like, we don't love companies that are really built on advertising. Um, we, we want the customer to be the ones that are driving the growth and, um, you know, and kind of revenue of the company through a willingness to pay. And I, I think the other thing that's important is while we, a lot of our companies look like their early stage, a number of them are actually been around for a long time, like Barstool started 10 years before we invested in it. Well, it was, you know, started by the founder in his garage, putting out a newsletter, you know, it'd been around and they had built a big following the same with Food 52, the same with Meat Eater that I mentioned, which was in six seasons of its television show. And so you're also seeing, um, you know, a, a comp or a, I, I say company loosely, um, because a passionate audience is willing to continue to, you, they want the content that's being provided to them by this founder in some way. And so you can, you can understand it, you know, kind of as Mark was saying, through a longevity of, of the audience and a consistent growth of the audience over that time. Well, I mean, from the fact that we're doing this from a video screen rather than in person, you know, I think ushers in the elephant in the room, which is COVID, right? And clearly going to an in-person event, whether it was a movie theater um, or a sporting event or what have you, was not possible for the past year and a half. So, you know, things have obviously started to change, but we're not quite there yet. How did that change, you know, each of your investment thesis for you know, the finance professionals and how that changed the strategic plan for the two executives. Um, and, and how do you view that going forward now that we're in a little bit of a transitional period? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll take a shot at that first, Lauren, if that's okay. Um, you know, for us, uh, we didn't really change what we were looking for as a result of COVID and the pandemic. Um, and we avoided in particular uh, businesses that seemed to, you know, get a boost because our belief was that was unlikely to be sustainable. And, and we had some companies that um, were beneficiaries in that way. We had others that, you know, suffered as a consequence because of canceling of live events. Um, but, but we had the perspective that this was uh, at least going to be temporary in some time frame. And so did not want to invest behind sort of a temporary movement as opposed to a more you know, fundamental movement. You can look at it and say, well, it did help um, the areas of call it you know, health or wellness. You know, I think that was something that boosted it that will be sustainable. You know, even as we return to some form of normal, people are gonna to continue to wanna to care. And 
pay attention to their health and wellness. Uh, but for a lot of businesses, we just weren't comfortable doing something fundamentally different as a result. And because we're not short term investors, right? And another way to look at it is sometimes I get asked, well, you know, boy, the stock market's at an all time high, or it's been periods when it's been had a terrible, you know, how do you get comfortable making an investment in this environment? You know, and our comment is, or I would say, you know, I'm likely to be on this board seven to 10 years from now. Uh, no one knows based on the current environment, what it's gonna look like in seven years. So that just shouldn't be a factor in our consideration in terms of what we're investing in. And, and the same applies um, for us with COVID. You know, our, our belief is seven years from now, this will not be a factor. So if we're investing for that horizon, it shouldn't really be a driver. Lauren, what about you guys? How did this change your investment thesis? And then uh, Steve and Paul, maybe you can jump in after that about how it's changed uh, your strategic plan and operations. Yeah, I mean, I think we looked at it the exact same as Mark, which is, if anything, trying to shy away from things that we thought were getting a COVID boost. Um, we also think that our general thesis is uh, hopefully kind of agnostic to these type of ups and downs in the market, because if you are providing a product or content that people feel passionate about anyways, then if anything, an event like COVID is going to result in people having more time to spend on their hobbies, which means uh, companies like Steve, as I'm sure he will tell you, where we're talking about tabletop games had an amazing COVID, but we also recognize that that's a COVID boost and you know is hopefully that will people will continue to play a lot of tabletop games but um you know you want you want companies that are going to withstand the ups and the downs and just continue along um growing in in the way that they do and so we were we were very much shying away i also agree with what mark said about kind of understanding that people were probably looking more at health and wellness during this time period and also what habits were being were changing as a result of COVID that we thought would stay permanently. So for example, we um, you know are investing in a, a bicycling company that was announced a couple of months ago and um, you know because we think that the shift of people over towards, bicycling is accelerating as a result of COVID, but that people will continue to spend a lot of time and money um, doing that sort of activity. Paul and Steve, I'm gonna kick it to you guys. Yeah, yeah so- I'll oh, go ahead, Steve. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, COVID was really interesting for a tabletop games company because all of a sudden the entire world was stuck at home and needed stuff to do. So, you know, Exploding Kittens ended up doing very well through the all of 2020, starting kind of what well, the entire year, really things came up in March, where we were seeing, you know, typical year end level sales, but in Q2, which is typically our, our slower quarter. Um, and so if anything, what COVID allowed us to do, because we didn't, we didn't have any negative impacts from a uh, finance or growth perspective, it allowed us to just accelerate all of our plans that were pre-existing again, film and television, digital games, all, you know, spending a lot of time in international expansion. It allowed us to just keep, keep moving faster and faster. I will say this is more on the operational internal side. It is very difficult to design and play test games when you can't be in the same room. So I know that was a very, very tricky thing for Alon and, and, and Zach and our design team to figure out how to do it. Um, and they did a tremendous job and were able to ship a number of games designed almost entirely without ever seeing each other face to face, which is not how we typically work. So getting back into the office will allow us to accelerate that side even quicker now. But, you know, I, and I think we're probably a rare case. If you ask a lot of operating executives, not many people were in our position, but for us, it ended up being, a a non-issue. I think the other, the other biggest thing we had to, to deal with was supply chain. So we had all of a sudden massive consumer demand and we had, you know, all of the supply chain was just being ground to a halt and factories are closing and shipping was slowing down. And so just keeping things in stock was really, really tricky. I think what we did to, which I'd love to say it was super prescient and we were thinking through all the angles, 
But what we did do very early on is we said, we have no idea what's going to happen here. We could try and model stuff out, but we don't know. Let's order everything we could possibly need for this year. Because at the end of the day, you know, the economics of a tabletop games company are, are pretty good. Um, and we weren't worried so much about cash flow, but we realized at the end of the year, we'll either be in a situation where we've ordered too much inventory, but it's stuff we know we will sell in 2021, or we'll be in a position where we're really lucky that we ordered way more than we thought we would need. And it kind of protected us on both ends. And, and doing that ended up being a really uh, smart move because we pretty much sold out of almost all of it through the end of the year. And it allowed us to operate in a way where while a lot of other businesses were struggling, we were, we were doing really well, but we weren't uh, handicapped by externalities like supply chain. We were able to grow as much as our consumers would let us in that time period. Paul, how's COVID impacted you guys? It's been, look, it's been interesting in, in good ways and bad ways that, you know, sort of the, what we took advantage of similar to Steve said is we sort of accelerated a lot of the development work that we would have otherwise done because uh, that can be done, you know, in smaller groups. And a lot of it is, you know, having scripts written that maybe we would have pushed out a little bit further to go. You know, we were fortunate we shot two movies and a TV show during COVID, which, you know, increased the pricing of everything we were doing just because the nature of having to, you know, test everybody every 36 hours and bring in a lot of PPE. But what it allowed us to do is get movies ready that will be uh, delayed a little bit, but we're going to put them out in January, February next year when hopefully, you know, theaters are really back open to where they were, you know, back to the point where they were before COVID. The other thing we did is really took some time to look at where consumers are, you know, watching content or listening to content. And, you know, a business that we weren't originally in was the podcast business. And we ended up taking a number of our scripts that would have otherwise probably gone series and turned them into one hour drama podcasts, uh, just because that business has grown in such an amazing way. And that's a shift in the business that we didn't think we were going to get into initially, but lent itself very easily to do. You can do those, you know, almost by yourself. Um, so it, it gave us a, an ability to focus on, you know, sort of the basics of where we wanted to be and what spaces we wanted to be from a distribution platform, you know, with, having two releases move from 2021 to 2022 is never something you want to do just from a cash flow standpoint, but you know, you're not going to rush something to get out theatrically if you're not going to have the audience there. It just makes no sense to do it. And what we tried to avoid was going straight to streaming, which a lot of people did. Um, but the model, the business model theatrically has changed. And I think, you know, it was something that was going to change eventually and COVID sort of sped it up in these sort of reduced windows between theatrical and some of the other distribution platforms. So we've been able to monitor and watch that as we go. Um, and you just, you pivot to it. You just, you figure out the way to keep your you know, business sustainable uh, and do as much as you can do sort of in the downtime. Um, but the one thing it did do is show that you can get work done with people almost anywhere in the world, uh, which has you know, been a good healthy change, I think for almost everybody. You touched on something I wanted to get all of your perspectives on, and that was, you know, there's a lot of new streaming services um, like Netflix, you know, podcasts that are increasing in their um, demand. Amazon continues to be a behemoth, you know, in an omni-channel sort of way. How does that impact the way you guys are looking at this convergence between, um, you know, sort of investing and media and, and sort of the expansion either one direction or another from content into um, products and other revenue streams. Look, I, I can touch briefly on that. I mean, it's it's interesting from a content creator standpoint because there's so many places that need content now and they just, they can't consume enough. Um, what it has done a little bit is stabilize what we think the profitability of some of the content we create is. It, it, takes away some of the equity risk because a lot of the modeling around these things are not based on performance, but based on percentages of budget, especially in the streaming world. The one downside to that is, you know, the huge upside you would have on a one-off film or TV show that you, you know, could go out and be lightning in a bottle doesn't really exist anymore, which I don't think is a bad thing for our industry overall, um, especially from an investor standpoint where you're not hoping on the big win, but really looking at it and, stabilizing a lot of these cash flow streams, you know, across distribution platforms. You know, we look at it and we try and diversify across everything. That's why we don't have a deal with one particular either streamer or network or, or, you know, studio. What we try to do is again, find the best content, make it creatively what it can be the best for the audience 
and then figure out the right place to go ahead and release it. I think it's been a plus as far as opportunities for us on the investment side. It, it's really educated and in some ways trained the consumer to pay for the content they want outside of the cable bundle. And as you get more and more cord cutters and cord nevers who are willing to do a la carte, you know, paying for what content is valuable to them uh, really helps the kind of businesses that we're involved in. Um, as I think I said previously, I wouldn't want to have to be bidding against them for content, you know, so I, I want to be on the create it and own it side of the content side. And then they represent additional pipes, you know, and it used to be a, a coax cable to the home or a satellite dish, but now it's a pipe that's being streamed. So uh, in general, it's been a plus for investment and, and, and it's a general plus whenever you have a change in the landscape, you know, shifting landscape changes, creates opportunities, creates, you know, windows, some niches, some big opportunities. Um, it's much, much better than a static environment and status quo. I think, you know, from the, the EK perspective, there, there's a, a couple different parts of it that I think are, are interesting. One, just the, to Paul's point, there are so many buyers out there now that there's, they're, they're all looking for content, but they're also looking for exclusive content that has an audience. And so when you have the Netflixes and Amazons and Disney Plus, et cetera, out there, HBO Max, that's a, that's a compelling environment if you have something like EK has, which is a really uh, specific brand and um, uh, kind of IP universe that's been built. Uh, and so that provides a really interesting opportunity to be able to expand outside of board games into film and television relatively quickly. The other thing I'll say about it is in success, there's kind of a flywheel feedback loop for our overall business in that, let's say you, you put, you know, EK content on one of these large SVODs, you're hitting a hundred million consumers with content that will invariably just bring more people into the world and drive more uh, more purchases for our games. I mean, to shift my perspective just a little bit, if I you know put my old TCG hat on and think about it from a meat eater perspective, you know we can see in the data that when uh, when a new season of meat eater comes out, there is an impact on the rest of the meat eater lines of business. A bunch more, you know millions of people are watching a TV show that is revenue positive and profitable for the company that also serves a dual marketing purposes and brings them into consumer products and first light in the podcasts and live events and buying books and what have you. So there's kind of an interesting flywheel dynamic that can happen for businesses that aren't principally uh, entertainment and media based when they have other lines of business. Well, but then, you know, let, let's talk for a quick second about the Amazon effect, right? I mean, they have Amazon Prime, but they also have uh, you know the ability to own their own product and distribute product? I mean, how do you compete against something like that? I mean, in, in EK's case, it's you know we're there isn't going to be an Amazon Brands version of Exploding Kittens because there's there's that IP. So there's you know we have that defensible IP which allows us to you know protect our product generally. Um, Something like Amazon's always uh, an, an interesting uh, thing for us because on one hand, they're a huge sales channel and they, they're an easy way to reach people all over the world. Um, at the same time, when we think about our own direct consumer business and building businesses outside of Amazon, you're never, you know, no one's fooling us to think we're gonna ever beat them on shipping and things like that. Like there's, there's certain things we can't compete against. Um, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. They're very important, but they're also a competitor. Um, I think you just kind of, you just have to navigate it as best you can. Yeah, I think for, for most of my companies that are selling hard goods, physical goods, e-commerce, Amazon is certainly a component of what they do, but they tend to be careful about curating a selection of their products for Amazon. Um, use it because it's convenient. Amazon is really set up to be uh, very responsive and great for the consumer. They're less responsive and great for, you know, companies that supply the products that they send out. 
Uh, but it is a good discovery platform as well for a lot of these companies to, to establish, again, a curated set of products that, that then leads to uh, them being able to have a, a more direct relationship ultimately on their own .com. So uh, I, I think most of the companies look at it that way. So I have one last question that I'll put out to the group and you know, you, you all can answer or some of you can answer and that, you know, what do you guys see as sort of the near-term trends for this convergence between sort of media content, PE, physical product, and what would you want folks in this ACG audience to know? I think content is um, a great place to be, whether you're an operator or an investor. That's our conviction. That's why we're here. The right content is must have content. That's high value. And for on the e-commerce side, as we touched on, you know, having your own media, having your own content that's compelling is really the future so that you're not dependent. I mean, the new iOS and privacy rules and all of these things are really going to um, reduce the value of those traditional uh, social media acquisition channels. And so best to have your own content. Yeah, I think where we're spending a lot of time, like I imagine a lot of PE firms are doing right now is in the crypto world, NFTs in the content that's built on blockchains and Web 3.0. You know, I think that that's where we see kind of the future of content that um, can result in new opportunities, new growth strategies, you know, for existing companies, or there's just a lot of new content type companies out there that are um, in that space. Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting you say that because whereas we used to have tons of footage that, you know, you intend to have in either a film or a TV show that ultimately, you know, sort of hit the cutting room floor, we're now finishing all of that material you know, to completion while we finish wow. the film and we're going to look to sell pieces of that as NFTs. And it's just, and it, cool. you know, it's, as Mark said, I mean, every time there's a shift in the business, you look to, you know, shift with it. And if that's an additional revenue stream that we can own those rights and control those rights and sell those rights. And it's something that, you know, will bring added value to the films uh, and to the TV shows we're doing. It's, it's an area we're actively looking at. The unions don't agree with us so much yet, but uh, you know, that's that you always know you're under a good change when you're getting a fight from the unions. Exactly. Uh, so it's uh, it's something that we're looking at in that way. Steve, I'll give you the last word. What do you see as the near term trends and what would you want this audience to know? Yeah, I think look, we we live in a world now where content creation is ubiquitous. Everyone's a content creator and there's more than we can possibly consume. Distribution's ubiquitous as well. And getting, you know, mind share of any audience is very difficult. And there are a couple of different ways to do it. Obviously, things like sports, you know, Mark, Mark has in a lot of those can be very compelling because there's, uh, you know, a scarcity aspect, aspect to it. I think when I look at it from the EK perspective, uh, in that world where there's so much out there, building a strong brand and really strong defensible IP that is differentiated and sets itself apart from the crowd and builds that authentic audience and that passion becomes vitally important. It helps you separate from everything else out there. And if you can find that, and, and this is where it's really tricky because it's lightning in a bottle. The, you know, the Alons and Mats of the world do not come around very often. Uh, like Mark mentioned earlier, like you kind of see it, you know when you see it sometimes. If you can find that as an investor, then it opens up a lot of different uh, avenues toward being able to build a diversified, profitable business that bridges content and media, and then also some of these other areas around consumer products and subscriptions and podcasts and live events, et cetera. So I think that's kind of the way I see it is if, if you can figure that out, a lot of the other stuff can start to fall in place. But if you don't have that, it can be much more difficult to be successful. Thank you, you guys. Michael? Yeah, thank you. And so Steve, Paul, Lauren, and, and Mark, really appreciate your time. It's been a really a fascinating discussion. And I think one that's going to be increasingly relevant as we've, as we've talked today uh, for our private equity and investment banking members here. And I love the, uh, 
the example that Lauren and, and Andrew were able to connect on where we had almost the, the, the holistic ACG deal community came together there in, in a single deal. We didn't script that, but it happened anyhow. So I appreciate that. Andrew, as always, uh, your help in crafting the conversation today, bringing together this wonderful lineup. I want to thank you for, for the time that you spent making today happen. And obviously the work that you put forward on ACG's board at a national level, at the local level. Um, you know, volunteer members like yourself really do give this organization a lot of the value and, and, and leadership element that that makes it one of the best, I think, in the middle market community. So for those of you out there who have participated today and watched today, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, do visit our website. We've got a host of exciting events coming up and perhaps not the least of which is live events where you're allowed to actually meet with people in person uh, and, and network uh, in distances that are less than six feet, uh, if you care to. So do go and check our website. We've got a lot of uh, events coming up for the remainder of the year. Again, for our panelists and our moderator, thank you so much uh, and take care.